The views and opinions expressed in this program are not necessarily those of Union Broadcasting Incorporated, ESPN Kansas City, or its employees. The host is solely responsible for the on-air content. The following program is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice. Investing in ETFs involves risk, including potential loss of principal. Any past performance figures discussed are not necessarily indicative of future results. Visit ETFstore.com for more information. Now it's time for the ETF Store Show. The investment pros at the ETF Store discuss everything you need to know about exchange-traded funds and the world of investing. Whether you're an investing expert or just starting out, Nate and Connor will help you get up to date on what's happening on Wall Street and show you how exchange-traded funds can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and allow you to take advantage of investment opportunities around the world. And now, the host of the ETF Store Show, Nate Geraci. Welcome to the ETF Store Show. Nate Geraci and Connor Kelly in studio. As always, thank you so much for joining us. We have a nice show for you today. Christian Magoon, CEO of Amplify ETFs, will be on the program to spotlight the Amplify Yield Shares CWP Dividend and Option Income ETF. And this is an interesting ETF. For one, it's actively managed. There's a manager attempting to pick 20 to 25 S&P 500 stocks that have strong earnings, cash flow growth, and increasing dividends. And then two, this ETF tactically writes covered calls on those stocks to create additional income. And the overall idea here is to generate portfolio income, but do so in a manner that provides less risk than maybe a typical dividend ETF play, and theoretically with better total returns. I'm looking forward to this conversation because, as we'll talk about here in just a moment, active managers have had some real challenges generating outperformance. So I'm curious to hear Christian's views on the value of active management and also what he thinks about the longer-term potential for actively managed ETFs. And then the other interesting aspect here is this covered call strategy. And if you're not familiar with covered calls, this can be a good way to add some income to your portfolio. And we'll be sure to have Christian explain how this works. But Connor, even though rates have begun to rise and we expect the Fed to raise rates tomorrow, finding income is still a monumental challenge for investors right now, which means an ETF like this could certainly be worth a, a look. Right, Nate. Even though yields have gone up, and, and again, we're pretty much everybody's assuming another raise coming tomorrow um, after the Fed wraps up their two-day meeting, um, there's still a lot of ways to go. And if the Fed would raise rates, it'll be the third time in the last 16 months, which is very encouraging for conservative income-focused investors. But we are still nowhere close to what has been historically a normal interest rate environment. And in this low-rate environment we're in, investors have had to take more risk than they're used to in order to find yield. You know, CDs, bonds, money markets, those traditional safe havens to, to generate safe yields aren't generating enough for most investors today. So people have had to take more risk, investing in things like high-yield bonds or also called junk bonds, emerging market bonds, MLPs, REITs, dividend-paying stocks, investments that are obviously much more risky than CDs, investment-grade bonds, and money markets. Covered calls are a unique way to generate additional income or yield on an investment. And we're going to dig into what a covered call is, obviously, with Christian, but it's because it's an area foreign to probably most average investors. So it's certainly an ETF that, that got our interest because they do combine the dividend-paying companies with covered calls to try to generate an even higher yield than just the stocks on their own. Yeah, so Christian Magoon will join us later in the program to spotlight that ETF. And then, uh, Connor, you and I will also talk about the current bull market turning eight years old last week and whether there's any end in sight to this uh, just remarkable run we've seen from stocks. We'll do that in our weekly market update. As always, if you have questions or comments, you can visit ETFstore.com. You can email us at advice at ETFstore.com, or you can always message us through Twitter. Now, as I alluded to earlier, I want to start the show today with the latest performance from actively managed mutual funds. And, you know, Connor, it's funny because years ago when we started this show, I feel like we just beat this topic into the ground about how the vast majority of active fund managers underperform their benchmarks every year. And even the ones uh, who may outperform in a given year are highly unlikely to do so again the following year. And quite frankly, I do feel like this debate of active versus passive has grown a, a bit stale. It's a tired debate. The data is now out there for everyone to see. This really isn't a big secret anymore. 
However, every now and then I do think it's still worthwhile to review the most recent data. And there have been several reports released uh, recently over, uh, you know, here over the past few weeks. Uh, So I thought we might spend just a few minutes on this today. And the first report I want to mention is the S&P Dow Jones Indices Persistence Scorecard. And what this report does is look at the ability of an active manager to deliver consistent outperformance over a given period of time. So the new report was just released in February. And even though we know what this data typically looks like, I've got to say the results are still astounding to see. They found that out of 1,034 large cap mutual funds that existed in September of 2013, only 204 of those funds or less than 20% outperform the S&P 500 over the next year. Okay, fine. However, over the following year, out of those 204 funds that outperformed in the first year, listen to this, less than 16% of those funds outperformed the S&P 500 that second year. And then by the end of the third year, zero, zilch, none of the original 204 funds were able to outperform the S&P 500. So, So kind of let me repeat that. Not one, not one large cap U.S. stock fund was able to outperform the S&P 500 for three straight years in the period ending September 2016. Nate, those numbers are almost hard to put your head around. I mean, this shows how difficult sustained outperformance is. The fact that zero funds out of over a thousand could not outperform the S&P for three straight years is astounding. And what that tells us is the small amount of funds that do outperform in one particular year is essentially random luck. Because if you cannot sustain the outperformance, it's hard to claim that it's skill-based. And when you consider only 33 funds out of those 1,000 could only pull off the outperformance for just two straight years, that number shrinks to basically 3% of the funds outperformed for two years and then obviously, like you said, zero could actually pull it off for three. It's just overwhelming data that show how hard it is for active funds to overcome the hurdle of high fees to generate performance for their investors. Well, you know, even broadening out the data, S&P Dow Jones, uh, Dow Jones Indices, they looked at the performance of a much larger universe of actively managed U.S. stock mutual funds. So this wasn't just large cap. They looked at all domestic stock funds and they looked at performance over a much longer period of time. They looked from March 2003 through September 2016, and they looked at uh, rolling three-year periods. You know what the percentage of funds were that outperformed for three consecutive years? And again, remember, this was tracked over a period of 13 years, uh, so this wasn't just cherry-picking a certain time period. The number was just over 7%. That's it. And again, this was a much broader universe. Each period had an average of over 2,300 Mutual funds. And actually, Nate, the same report looked beyond just U.S. stocks. Global equity stocks were also tracked, and they had around the same 7% outperformance number of the rolling three years, with emerging market stocks barely eking out over 5%, which for me is kind of funny because the claim from active funds are always that they can find opportunities in overseas markets, in in small, opaque ones like emerging markets where, you know, boots on the ground and that active manager can really show up performance. But the data show the complete rebuttal of that claim. And again, we're not cherry picking here. This is a rolling three-year window that covered 13 years in the market. And another argument you always hear um, in terms of active management is, well, you know, we've been in a bull market for the last eight years. It's hard for active managers to outperform since everything's going up, everybody's making money. But the study we're talking about covers the past 13 years, which happens to include one of the worst bear markets in our country's history. And that's the, mar- that's the market where the, the quote-unquote genius stock picker is supposed to swoop in and save the day. But that didn't happen. Outperformance by active ma- managers was almost non-existent and unsustainable during this entire period that covered, yes, an eight-year bull market that we've enjoyed, but also the second worst stock collapse in our country's history. Well, to add to that, think about uh, even recently. You know, last year we had the worst start to a year for stocks in history. We had the Brexit. We had all the uncertainty surrounding the election. And guess what? According to Bank of America Research, only 19% of active mutual fund managers were able to outperform their benchmarks in 2016. And even more recently, just since uh, Trump's taken office, 
What's happened is correlations between individual stocks have declined fairly significantly. And this is noteworthy because active managers will tell you that lower correlations make it easier for them to pick stocks that might outperform, right? They made the excuse, right. uh, as you kind of alluded to, over the past eight years, since everything is going up and stocks are much more highly correlated, there's less dispersion in returns. And so it's tough for them to really add value. So theoretically, since correlations have now come down, the last several months should have been a, a great time for active fund managers to pick stocks, right? Wrong. Bank of America also released data showing that only 35% of active managers beat their benchmarks in February. Now, I should mention that was down from a whopping 52% in January. So certainly better than the 19% from last year, but still basically a coin flip or worse that you would have seen out performance. And again, this is the type of environment where active managers say they can add value. Look at the data we've discussed, whether it's a raging bull market or one of the worst bear markets in history, whether it's high correlation between stocks or low correlation between stocks, whether it's high volatility or low volatility, regardless of the market conditions, the data show that actively managed mutual funds drastically underperform their benchmarks. At a certain point, you have to accept that this is a fact and adjust how you will manage your money going forward. The worst thing you can do as an investor is just put your head in the sand and pretend that this isn't reality because it is. Yeah. Now, every time we cover this particular topic on the show, I, I, I do always like to point out, look, this isn't about us attempting to bash active mutual fund managers. Quite frankly, from my own personal experience in interacting with these managers, I would tell you that these are truly some of the smartest, most talented people in the country. I, I really mean that. These are extremely bright minds. Without a doubt. So I just want to be clear. We're not saying... You know, there are a bunch of idiots managing these funds. But what it comes down to is two very simple things. Number one, these really smart managers are all competing with each other. You, you have to remember that. Some are going to win and some are going to lose. And then number two, fees. These managers have to make money and they have to pay for teams of analysts. And they, they need to market the mutual funds and pay for all the back uh, back office administration. These things cost money. And so that's reflected in higher fund fees. And so, you know, the point here is even if these managers are somehow able to beat their peers, which, again, is very difficult because yeah. these are really smart, talented managers, it's typically not by enough to overcome the fees that they're charging. Right. It, it, Nate, to your point about the competition in, in the mutual or in the ma professional money manager space, there's an old saying about poker. If you can't tell who the sucker is at the table after 30 minutes, it's it's you. And that used to be true of investing. There were so many amateurs trying to manage their money actively, going against some of the best and brightest minds in investing. Well, it was easy picking. It, it was. It, and that trend has slowed down now and, and maybe even stopped. And the reality is all of these very talented poker players, to, to keep my analogy going, are all playing against themselves without, a, without any of the easy marks sitting at the table. And here's a perfect real-life illustration of how crowded the room has gotten with professional money managers. A, a CFA is a uh, very well-respected, maybe the hardest designation to get in our field. It's a chartered financial analyst. It basically takes three years for you to achieve this in a best-case scenario of studying nonstop. And in 1963, there were 284 CFAs in the entire U.S. In 2015, there are over 177,000 CFAs. I mean, that is insane. And all of these extremely intelligent, uh, well-trained guys and gals are trying to beat each other in a very difficult game. Well, you know, another way to think about this, uh, you know, I always like sports analogies. And one of my favorite sporting events, the NCAA tournament, uh, begins this week. Think about if the entire tournament field was comprised of 68 teams all as good as Kansas or Villanova or UCLA. These are really good teams, but obviously they can't all win. Somebody has to win and somebody has to lose. And that's what happens in investing, right? These fund managers beat each other up. They're all very good, but that's why it's so tough to win consistently. You know, if Kansas played uh, North Dakota State every single game in the tournament, well, they would probably win the whole thing. But if they played UCLA every game, that's highly unlikely. And then, you know, when it comes to mutual funds, you add those fees back into the equation. It's just a tough combination to overcome. 
Well, let's keep your analogy going, Nate. I mean, back in the day, everybody knows John Wooden's UCLA teams that rattled off 10 NCAA titles in the span of 12 years. The reality was he's one of the certainly the greatest coaches ever that lived, but the competition wasn't nearly as solid. And all of the elite talent was limited to just a handful of schools at that time. That is no longer the case in college basketball, and it's not the case anymore in investing. There are too many talented people trying to beat each other, and clearly not everybody can win. But all of that being said, I continue to believe the biggest issue here is fees because the hurdle that high fees create for these active funds is so difficult to overcome each year. And we've discussed this changing landscape of investing for a while now. It's no longer active versus passive. It's high cost versus low cost. We do believe that there are very talented managers out there. We've met them at some of these conferences and them coming by our offices and talking about the new ETFs are launching and whatnot. And, and they could provide value to their investors, provided the fees on their funds are low enough that it doesn't make it impossible for them to outperform each year. Well, and the other aspect here is investors are now demanding lower fees. They've become educated on this. Bloomberg's Eric Balkunas calls this the great cost migration. Investors are now moving to lower fee funds. You know, he had an unbelievable chart that I tweeted out last week that showed over the past year, basically the cheaper the fund or ETF, the larger the net inflows into the fund. And any fund with an expense ratio greater than 0.5% actually had negative net inflows. I also tweeted out another chart. This was from a Goldman Sachs. This showed that as of February 15th of this year, since 2012, $486 billion has gone into ETFs and $464 billion has come out of mutual funds. That's been driven by cost. But look, again, I'll be the first to say I would love to use active managers if they could clearly show consistent outperformance. And I think uh, transparent, actively managed ETFs are actually a tremendous opportunity for old guard mutual fund companies and even upstarts. We're going to talk to Christian Magoon here later in the program, and they offer an actively managed ETF. So I'm, I'm very interested to hear how it's constructed, but also talk to Christian about how he views the potential value of active managers and, and the potential long term for actively managed ETFs. And look, you know, we'd be the first to use these types of ETFs if the data supports it. But, you know, right now, Connor, we have to, you know, look at the data. And right now it's just not the case. Right. We're, we're not anti-active management. We're not blindly following some passive-only dogma with our eyes shut to everything else. Like you said, we're data-driven. Our, deci our decisions are driven by facts and investment outcomes. If some actively managed ETFs show sustained outperformance down the road, which I do think could happen at some point because fees are going to be so much more compressed in ETFs compared to mutual funds, we'll begin considering these funds for the management of our clients' accounts, but not until that sustained outperformance actually shows itself. All right, we need to take a break here, but a few quick takeaways I'll leave you with. Number one, know the odds of success if you're considering using active fund managers. Right now, as, as we were just saying, the data uh, does clearly show the vast majority underperform their benchmarks. And the ones who may outperform in a given year have a very low probability of sustaining that outperformance. So you should know that going in. Number two, if you are going to use active managers, look for those with lower costs. You have a much better chance of success with lower cost funds. And I would add that you should look for funds with high conviction managers. In other words, you want funds with high active share, funds that aren't just closet index funds. They're doing something different than the benchmark. Otherwise, you're just buying an expensive index fund. And then number three, if you want to be guaranteed something very close to what the market returns, just use low cost index funds and ETFs. Perhaps the best report on active fund, uh, active fund performance is Morningstar's Active Passive Barometer. And they just released their most recent report last week. I would highly encourage everyone to go Google this report and, and really take a look at it. It's a fantastic report. But remember, this is Morningstar. This is the preeminent fund research company in the world. You know what two of their key takeaways were on this report? Number one, investors would greatly improve their odds of success by favoring low-cost funds which succeeded far more often than high cost funds over the long term. So that was number one. And then number two, the average dollar in passively managed funds typically outperforms the average dollar in actively managed funds. So I think that sums it up pretty well.
Let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll have our weekly market update, and we'll then be joined by Christian Magoon, CEO of Amplify ETFs. This is the ETF Store Show. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show. Nate and Connor in studio. Let's go right to our weekly market update. And now it's time for this week's market update. Tune in every week as the ETF Store brings you the information you need to know on the financial markets. A mixed week for stocks last week. Both the S&P 500 and Dow Jones Industrial Average were down over a third of a percent. But the Nasdaq was up about a quarter of a percent for the week. Now, we mentioned last week that the current bull market recently turned eight years old. Of course, it began on March 9th, 2009, after the global financial crisis. And the S&P 500 is currently up some 250% since that time. Bloomberg had an interesting piece last week talking about how stock valuations are now on the high side and volatility is nowhere to be found. And they were trying to make some sense of this current situation. This piece had a great title, Freakish peace envelops bull market as eighth year rolls by. And the thrust of the article was whether or not the stock market is healthy right now after eight years of gains. They talked about how there's a there's been a number of uh, or there's no there's been a lower number of one percent or greater intraday swings than usual. And they noted how the Fed recently, uh, quote, expressed concern that the low level of implied volatility in equity markets appeared inconsistent with the considerable uncertainty attending the outlook. They also provided some other interesting data points regarding current stock valuations and and the lack of volatility in the markets. Connor, this is very timely because when you and I talk to investors, the longer this bull market goes on, the more concerns we're hearing. And I think investors are becoming afraid that we may be reaching a, a peak here. High valuations is something we're hearing more and more, uh, not only in the media, but in conversations with clients. It certainly comes up after eight years of a bull market. Here's the reality, though, with with valuations. High high valuations don't predict market tops. What they do tell us is that things are richly valued right now, so lower returns are are likely in the future. And the same can be true when valuations – the opposite can be said when valuations are cheap. Right, that that higher returns are likely in the future. High valuations don't predict predict market corrections. Another way of even thinking about this is uh, looking at this is high valuations mean stocks have been on a very good run, and investors in stocks have made a lot of money. It's therefore more likely that we'll make less money in stocks in the near future than we have in the past. I mean, that's really it. That's all. You know, a PE ratio or valuations, whatever your metric is, that's all it's telling you at this point. It's not a predictor of the apocalypse, a recession, a pullback, none of that. It's the reality that we've been on a very good run, meaning you have to expect and brace yourself for likely lower returns in the future. Well, here's the thing. Everyone wants to know when the stock market will peak. And I I know this isn't a, a sexy answer, but the fact is, Nobody knows. Ben Carlson, who is director of institutional asset management over at Ritholtz, uh, we've had him on the program before. Uh, He wrote an excellent piece also for Bloomberg. It was titled Calling a Top in Stocks Has Become a Cottage Industry. And he provided data going all the way back to World War II that showed there's no discernible pattern when you look back at prior stock market tops. He said, quote, the stock market has experienced bear markets with high valuations and low valuations, high bond yields and low bond yields, high dividend yields and low dividend yields, high inflation and low inflation. And his point was simply that trying to call a top in the market is really a fool's errand. He he included the old uh, John Maynard Keynes quote that markets can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. Mm -hmm. You know, Connor, I can't help but tie this back to our conversation earlier on the performance of actively managed mutual funds. The fact is... Nobody can predict the future. And even people like you and I who, look, we eat, sleep, and breathe the financial markets, but we don't have a crystal ball. And maybe some people don't like hearing that. But for us, because we accept that, we can focus on things that we believe really matters when it comes to investing. Things like costs, taxes, 
investor behavior, diversification, asset allocation, rebalancing. Those are the types of things uh, to be worried about right now. This is the attitude you have to accept if you want to be a successful investor, that you cannot predict a market top. You don't have a crystal ball. Nobody else does. So forget about trying to do so. What you need to determine as an investor is, can you stick to your plan when we see a market correction? Because we will see one. That's the million-dollar question. Because if you can't stomach a 30% loss in stocks, then you are likely too aggressively invested and need to look very hard at how much risk you should have, how much you're taking, how much should you have in stocks. Investing is easy when stocks are moving up, but the rubber hits the road and people's behaviors are challenged in a down market, in a rough market. And that's when mistakes are made by investors that don't have the intestinal fortitude to stick through it when things are tough, or they simply didn't were taking too much risk to start with. Sticking to your plan, even if it's not the perfect plan, is the single most important aspect of successful investing. And while that's not nearly as exciting to talk about, you know, compared to calling market tops or, or picking penny stocks or any of these other, you know, exciting things that get people to listen to, to these, you know, shows on, on the media all day, nothing you do as an investor matters more than creating that plan and sticking to it, even when things are tough. Well, and the other thing that, that we always talk about is controlling the things that you can when it comes to investing. You can't control uh, when a bull market's going to peak or when a bear market bottoms, but you can control things like investment costs and the tax impact of your investments and your own investor behavior. Those are things that you can control. So I, I think it's always important to keep that in mind. We need to take a break, but I'll leave you with this. Warren Buffett was on CNBC a couple of weeks ago. Now, this is perhaps the greatest investor of many generations. Listen to what he says about his own ability to determine what the stock market is going to do next. Well, I don't have the faintest idea what the stock market's going to do tomorrow or next week or next month or even next year. I, I do know that over time, and we'll talk 10 years or something of the sort, that equities will do better than than, than uh than bonds, which is the main alternative, or bank deposits, or whatever it may be, fixed dollar investments for people. And uh, they're not going to be able to pick the time to come in. I don't know how to pick the time to come in. I've bought a lot of stocks in the last couple of months. That may turn out that the stock market goes down 20% or 30%. But that won't bother me if I like the businesses I bought. And Warren Buffett actually had another great quote later in that interview. He said, quote, stocks are safe for the long run. And they're very unsafe for tomorrow. And Connor, that gets back to your point on, on having the right plan. If you can't stomach the risks involved with stocks, you probably shouldn't be investing in them. Uh, but again, the fact is nobody, not us, not Warren Buffett, not mutual fund managers, nobody knows when the current bull market will end. All right, let's take a break. And when we come back, we'll be joined by Christian Magoon, CEO of Amplify ETFs. We'll spotlight the Amplify Yield Share CWP Dividend and Option Income ETF. You're listening to the ETF Store Show. Show Nature Racy and Connor Kelly in studio. Now it's time for our ETF Spotlight. It's time for the ETF Spotlight, where each week the ETF store highlights one exchange-traded fund. There are over 1,900 ETFs available for you to choose from. The ETF store sorts through and investigates them all so you don't have to. The ETF we're spotlighting this week is the Amplify Yield Shares CWP Dividend and Option Income ETF. The ticker symbol on that is DIVO. And joining us via phone from just outside Chicago to discuss this ETF is the CEO of Amplify ETFs, Christian Magoon. Hey, Christian, as always, great to have you on the program. Hey, thanks, Nate. Good to be with you and Connor today. Well, well Christian, it's clear from the name of this ETF that this is an income-oriented strategy. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was looking at the prospectus, and uh, it indicates that this ETF seeks to generate between 4 and 7% in gross income annually. Uh, let's just jump right in here. Walk us through the strategy. How is this ETF constructed? Yeah, so the... Uh Really, the genesis of the ETF is a separate managed account, an investment strategy that's uh, available to investors uh, at fairly high minimums. And what we did is uh, essentially take that strategy and turn it into an ETF with the advisor capital wealth planning. 
and it's unique in the sense that it's a dividend uh, strategy that also seeks another form of income, not just dividends, but option income. So uh, essentially the manager, this is an actively managed ETF, is going out and purchasing dividend yield securities. These are uh, generally large cap, uh, blue chip companies that uh, have sustainable earnings and cash flow. Uh, they have to have a history of increasing their dividend. And then the manager, besides just collecting the dividends from those stocks, actually is opportunistically writing covered calls when appropriate to increase the income potential of the fund. So, uh, you know, Devo really has two streams of income, traditional dividend income that most uh, investors are used to, and then also this other stream, which is option premium income uh, via writing covered calls opportunistically. So that uh, income in total, uh, the target is between 4 to 7% of year, or year of income for investors. Christian, for our listeners who may be unfamiliar with a covered call strategy, can you maybe explain this in, in layman's terms? How, how does this work? Sure. So uh, when you're holding an actual uh, underlying security, uh, one of the more conservative ways of uh, going out and uh, writing an option contract is to write a covered call. And essentially, that uh, uh, allows you to collect some premium income, uh, but it does cap your upside should that uh, stock appreciate substantially uh, from where you write that call. So uh, it's a way to essentially try to a look at stocks that may not potentially have a lot of upside, but uh, instead to kind of capture some additional income or total return by uh, writing that covered call and, and, and capturing that uh, premium income. Uh, in, 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 the, in the case of Devo, uh, the manager historically has been able to capture about 2 to 4% additional income by writing covered calls against these blue chip stocks uh, that they own in the fund. Now, obviously, a covered call strategy can generate some income, but it can also reduce downside risk as well. Can you maybe expand on why that's the case? Yeah, that's right. So if you uh, have the ability to take in that um, option income, uh, that's another cushion, if you will, to go against a potential decline uh, in the net asset value of the fund or of the individual securities. So, you know, as we're going to uh, probably uh, see a rise in interest rates this week uh, from the Fed, Uh, that's going to negatively impact probably dividend stocks. I think we've already seen a little bit of that happen in the marketplace. Uh, To be able to also write uh, some covered calls against some of those dividend stocks and capture several more percentage points potentially of of income or cushion can help cushion that uh, downward volatility that we could see in a rising rate environment. So you're right, the two benefits really are uh, not only a higher current stream of income, uh, and then potentially the ability to have a larger cushion against uh, market volatility. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why uh, Devo got uh, just recently nominated for Active ETF of the Year by ETF.com. Quite a unique strategy that allows dividend investors to kind of have that additional income through options or potentially that downside protection. Christian, give, give us an idea. What are some of the current top holdings in this ETF and what does the overall sector allocation look like right now, just at a high level? Yeah, yeah, good good question, Nate. So these companies are really blue chip companies, kind of Dow type companies. So Boeing, uh, United Health Group, Home Depot, Kraft, IBM, uh, uh, 3M. Uh, the sector allocation is uh, uh, really designed to be fairly similar to uh, kind of a broad based benchmark uh, like the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average. So you see. Um, consumer discretionary, industrial, technology stocks being amongst the top three sectors that the fund is exposed to. Um, And, you know, this is really kind of an alternative to buying just a traditional dividend ETF where you own these blue chip names and you collect the dividends. Uh, This gives you, again, this additional option to hopefully increase your income potential. As as we all know, there's probably not enough income out there for the demand (laughs) Uh, by investors who are many who are starting to retire in the baby boomer phase. Again, we're visiting with Christian Magoon, CEO of Amplify ETFs. We're spotlighting the Amplify Yield Share CWP Dividend and Option Income ETF, ticker symbol DIVO. Christian, I've got to tell you, uh, just for full disclosure, we actually spent much of the first part of our program discussing the underperformance of active fund managers. And as you mentioned, this is an actively managed ETF. There's a manager attempting to pick individual stocks that might outperform and then uh, tactically write covered calls on those stocks. 
Now, I, I know you've seen all the data on active manager underperformance. So uh, the question is, what makes this ETF uh, potentially different? Yeah, I think that's a you know great observation, and I agree. You know, indexes by and large have really crushed active managers. I think what makes this uh, different is that um, it's very hard to robotically write covered calls. Uh, you know, there are funds that do that, and they're index based. But uh, you know, as you know, markets change, conditions change, and you sometimes need to be dynamic in terms of your activity to be able to stay on top of writing covered calls. In fact. Uh, you know, if you just have an index that only does it once a month, you're likely to uh, really miss out on some opportunities. So I think Devo really, uh, the fact that it's actively managed is a benefit to investors because the manager can opportunistically go in and write those covered calls uh, throughout the month. It's not locked into what stocks they have to write covered calls on and when. Uh, and that's really allows them to capture kind of these unique income opportunities. Um, you know, I think... Uh, the, the stock selection also adds some value. I think uh, some of the basic rules they have in terms of how they select stocks are very index-like. So I think you're getting kind of in this ETF a very convenient and tax-efficient way to access an uh, opportunistic covered call strategy um, and that, that should uh, produce some pretty substantial current income versus a traditional ETF and do it ra- rather tax-efficiently. Christian, more broadly speaking, I'm curious as to how you view the potential of actively managed ETFs as a whole moving forward. You know, I've said for a long time that I do think this is a huge potential growth area, I think especially for old guard mutual fund companies. But if you look at the data at the end of 2016, according to Morningstar, there was less than $30 billion invested in active ETFs. That compared to more than $2.5 trillion in passive ETFs. What do you think it'll take for active ETFs to really gain traction? Yeah, well, I think um, part of the issue when you look at active ETFs is how do you define an active ETF? And, Nate, as you know, many of the indexes that are uh, out there are more active than what most people would think. And when you start com- uh, you're looking at so-called smart beta, strategic beta products that definitely take tilts or use fundamental screens, um, I think you know you could argue that they're quasi-active in nature, if not truly active. Um, but you know, I think just the traditional you know manager kind of uh, stock picker ETF, I think is uh, going to be something that um, probably isn't going to fulfill its its uh, promise that many people thought of back in kind of the early days of the poss- possibility for active ETFs. I mean, we've seen some great um, success uh, by Jeff Gunlock, for example, in the fixed income space. But no one's really been able to crack in a big way kind of that stock picking, uh, actively managed ETF space. And I think, you know, it's mostly because many of the great stock pickers, in my opinion, are in hedge fund world now. They really aren't in the mutual fund land. If they're in the mutual fund land, they don't want to be transparent with their picks, which is an issue currently with the structure of ETFs. So I think it's going to be a while. Um, I do think that some of these unique strategies where there's uh, the need for dynamic activity or responsiveness or there's a certain amount of convenience, that, convenience that's offered, like in the Devo ETF with writing covered calls inside the tax-efficient kind of wrapper of an ETF, I think those areas have some potential. But uh, I think, you know, for the ETF space, at least in the stock side, there's going to be con- uh, continued uh, growth of what we call smart beta or strategic beta, kind of the middle ground between traditional indexing and active management. You mentioned the concern that active managers may have uh, with the daily disclosure of holdings that's required by ETFs. I'm just curious, do you think that's a legitimate concern, uh, this fear of uh, potentially being front run? Yeah, I think there's some some market moving kind of managers out there that's that probably have a, a case to be made there. Uh, but, you know, the reality is many of these managers are probably disclosing their holdings in separate managed accounts on a daily basis. Uh, you know, Jeff Gunlock or Bill Gross, uh, two very you know, high-profile managers, are, are willing to show their portfolio holdings on a daily basis. Granted, it's fixed income. There's some, you know, different barriers to entry there versus the stock market. Uh, but, you know, by and large, I think most managers probably, uh, if they really sat down and thought about it, um, probably aren't moving markets and uh, probably wouldn't lose uh, their uh, so-called alpha by having kind of end-of-the-day portfolio disclosure in an ETF. And, you know, it's, it's 
possible. I mean, we're hearing rumblings that uh, the non-transparent active ETF may be around the corner. And uh, certainly with the Trump administration, I wouldn't be surprised to see um, that, um, that type of a product roll out here in the next year or so. Do you think there's any potential for uh, that type of product in, in terms of potentially gathering assets? Do you think that may be a better route to go for active managers? I think maybe from the active manager standpoint, it would be a lot more appealing, but it's hard for me to believe the investor would be uh, better served by that. I, I really think one of the key aspects that often gets overlooked about ETFs is the portfolio transparency they offer. I think portfolio transparency just allows investors to have better um, asset allocation information, and it allows them to make um, uh, more uh, decisions that ultimately benefit them in a way that's a lot greater than a non-transparent portfolio. Uh, you know, the, the practice of mutual funds only disclosing their portfolio legally once every quarter is crazy. I wouldn't read the newspaper once every quarter. I'd want to know who's on a daily basis to make my decisions. I think that most investors benefit from the transparency ETFs provide on a daily basis. So I think, uh, boy, for investors going to a non-transparent model, um, I think that they're getting maybe um, – uh, something that uh, will serve them less, I guess, in their pursuit of better asset allocation decisions. All right, Christian, going back to your transparent uh, ETF, the Amplify Yield Share CWP Dividend and Option Income ETF, uh, just summarize for us, where does this ETF fit in an investor's portfolio? Yeah, so the Devo ETF is really designed to fit in that area uh, in that investors may have for equity income strategies or dividend paying stocks and uh, in, in, in another way of saying it uh, you know the fund is really designed to provide the dividend income you're used to from blue chip names but in addition have a second stream of income uh, that could be another two to four percent on top of that traditional dividend stream of income uh, that would uh, you know allow investors to kind of capitalize, on, on some of the option premiums that are available on these blue chip companies. So uh, when you think of a traditional dividend ETF paying 2 to 3%, I think, in its target, uh, D Devo is seeking to uh, pay out somewhere between 4 and 7% based off historical numbers. And, again, that income coming from both dividends and the ability to write covered calls when appropriate uh, based off the manager. And, uh, you know, the manager's track record uh, for this strategy is in the prospectus of Devo, uh, and uh, that's something that investors can go out and look at. It's a new fund, but again, it's cloned based off an existing investment strategy, one that recently just was uh, given five stars by Morningstar for the separate managed account version. Uh, so uh, we're, we're pleased with the ability to provide this in ETF format um, and all the efficiencies that ETFs deliver to investors. And Christian, about two minutes left here. Uh, even though rates have ticked up, uh, over the past several months, we expect the Fed to raise rates again tomorrow. Obviously, finding yield has been one of the greatest challenges that investors have faced. Uh, just high level, how do you think investors should uh, think about balancing risk versus return, given where yields are at and, and where they may be heading? Yeah, that's, I think, a, a great point. Um, you know, most investors, I think, are always looking for kind of higher yielding securities. And when you look at kind of the yield universe, there are companies that have high yields, and then there's companies that are growing their yields, but their yields are quite a bit less generally. Um, we really think it makes sense to balance those two, looking for uh, companies that certainly have uh, high payouts that um, – that fit into an allocation, but just as important, finding companies that have lower payouts but are growing their payouts. Uh, when you're growing your payouts or growing your dividends, uh, that those types of companies have the ability to kind of hedge against rising interest rates, rising inflation, and those companies should perform better or be more appealing in a rising rate environment. So, um, you know, I think it's important to not just reach for yield. Uh, that's been going on for a number of years, and uh, for the most part, investors have benefited because rates haven't risen. But as rates rise, companies that grow their distributions uh, have the ability to hedge against kind of that, that rising rate risk and should outperform. Uh, one of the key stress screens in the Devo ETF is looking at companies that have grown their dividends, um, and that we think is important uh, aspect to any type of income strategy going forward in a rising rate environment. 
Well, Christian, with that, we'll have to leave it there. Uh, just a great spotlight today. As always, we appreciate you joining us on the program. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. That was Christian Magoon, CEO of Amplify ETFs. Again, the ETF is the Amplify Yield Share CWP Dividend and Option Income ETF, ticker symbol DIVO. And you can learn more about this ETF by visiting AmplifyETFs.com. Kind of we have just about a minute left here on the program. You know, we talked earlier in the program about the challenges active managers face. And I thought Christian did a great job of laying out uh, sort of the, the case for this particular ETF because of that that tactical uh, covered call strategy. Right. There, there are a couple things here. First is um, the, they're, they're kind of smart beta in terms of how they pick those underlying stocks they choose to hold. But he made a good point. You know, the, the, the cost of um, options or covered calls can literally change uh, very, very quickly. So they do find value in their managers being able to make those decisions intraday and not just automated once you know once a month. I totally get that. Um, the other limit we've we've talked about with active management is fees, and obviously the fees are lower with this ETF based pro- based um, fund being launched, right? So it, it's a very interesting fund, and and you know a, a yield of four to seven percent with these covered calls being added to it is obviously pretty attractive to a lot of conservative income focused investors. Yeah, and again, you get that in a transparent vehicle, a more tax-efficient vehicle. You don't have the, the cash drag. There's no minimums to access the ETF. Uh, so uh, certainly a very interesting strategy. That'll do it for today's show. Podcasts of the ETF Store Show are available at ETFstore.com, Apple iTunes, and Google Play. Connect with us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can stay up to date on all the latest from both the ETF Store and the ETF Store Show. Next week, Connor and I will be enjoying a nice spring break. So in our absence, be sure to catch the best of the ETF Store Show featuring some of our favorite guest interviews over the past several months. Until then, have a great week, everyone.